Pete Garrison is here to break Garrison, sorry, is here to break down the current and future landscape of space-based solar power. A senior fellow in defense studies at the American Foreign Policy Council, Mr. Garrison is an independent strategy consultant who focuses on space and defense. He has 33 years of experience working for the Department of Defense and served his country in the US Air Force, including as director of the Space Horizons Task Force at the US Air Force Air Command and Staff College. He is currently working on his PhD in public policy and has a master's in aviation and human factors from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He is a former member of the National Space Society Board of Directors, a thought leader in the area of space development, and he's currently writing a book on the great power competition for space resources. Pete, you have the screen. Thank you so much. Can you guys all hear me? Yes, and we can see your slides as well. So, you know, what a wonderful presentation by Coyote. It brings back so many memories and, and uh, it would be nice to be young again and, and be going through that all over again. You know, um, at the last minute, I wanted to add, I used to uh, start all my presentations on space solar power with this quote from Marshall McLuhan that only puny secrets need protection, that big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. And so much of the conversations that we had about space solar power were fundamentally about a, a, an inability to think big enough. Um, so I want to talk about space solar power. And I want to, first of all, you know, just put forward that, in my view, this is a different conversation, right? This is not just a conversation about a space exploration program. Uh, it is not just a, you know, one of many business ideas, right? This is an idea that links fundamentally to the chances of humanity to survive on this earth and flourish both here and beyond. So I wanna kind of start with where is the current conversation today? So we have had a change of administration and astoundingly the major pieces of US space policy have stayed intact from two extremely different uh, administrations. They have kept the Space Force, they have kept the NASA Artemis program, uh, they've kept an awful lot of the uh, space policy in place and they have kept the National Space Council. And you know now we have a new vice president that is about to take over that. And of course, one of the focuses is climate change and business. At the same time, we have a paper that has recently come out, but from aerospace, and I view that as significant because aerospace it is a trusted partner uh, across both NASA and uh, the Department of Defense saying that space solar power is a near-term investment decision. And I truly hope just to be upfront that space solar power will be one of the first big ideas considered by the new National Space Council. The most recent report that came out uh, on the government that mentioned space solar power was the State of the Space Industrial Base uh, report. Um, and I think Michael's got all the links for these, but it essentially said that we've got no identified coordinated vision and roadmap for space solar power. And, and as, a, uh, as a consequence, we are not postured to compete. Now, at the same time, uh, there was a process going through where uh, one of the other uh, speakers in, in Conversations for the Future, Dr. Namrata Goswami, had uh, uh, given a presentation to the US-China Economic and Security Commission. They had published their report last year, and then they got it into uh, the law for this year that says that the National Space Council shall do a comparative report on the US and China and specifically look at the uh, viability and environmental impacts of space mining, on-site exploitation, and space-based solar power, as well as the strategic interests in cislunar space. And I think this is you know, fairly major. Now, just to be upfront about what I would like to see you know, uh, come out of this, first of all, I would love to see a space policy directive come out of the, the new uh, National Space Council 
specifically on space solar power. I'd like to see another one come out on manufacturing objectives for the Artemis lunar base focused on production of materials for space solar power. I'd like to see a presidential finding on space solar power and space resources in Defense Production Act Title III. And of course, I would like to see passage of the Space Corporation Act that would create a way to fund not exploration, but actual development and infrastructure. And that requires government sponsored, re a government sponsored research portfolio of many different approaches to retire technical risk. It will require COTS like public partner, uh, private partnerships to create industries, not just technologies. And a big part of that is for the government to be an anchor or lighthouse customers, as well as to reduce the cost of financing and enable patient capital off the federal budget through things like bonds and to be able to fund and expand existing programs of which you'll hear me talk about two. Uh, one is Air Force Research Lab SPIDER and the other is a Secretary of Defense program run out of uh, Naval Research Lab that, uh, uh, that's not called PramFX, but that's its most recent fruit. So I wanna talk you know, first a little bit about space solar power and why it's so significant, right? You have to ask, you know, what if there was a chance to do something truly, truly ambitious in both energy and space? What if you had the ability to unlock really unlimited renewable energy? What if it was autocatalytic, meaning it would build many other infrastructures? What if it could mean as many as a million new jobs and a prosperous green future and many things beyond that? Would that not be worth doing? And in case no one's explained it, right, the idea of space-based solar power is this concept for a revolutionary energy system that involves placing into orbit stupendously large orbital power plants, kilometers across, which collect the sun's raw energy and beam it down to the point of need on Earth. And in theory, space solar power could scale to meet all humanity's energy need, providing virtually unlimited green renewable energy to that energy hungry world. Now, let me just pause for a minute to talk about why this vision is exciting. At this point, probably, you know, even if you are not a believer in climate change, you recognize that there are environmental costs of having a combustion economy and that there is utility in having electricity. It's easier on your lungs, it's easier on clean air. If you're concerned with carbon, you're concerned with the amount of you know, carbon that's being put into the atmosphere. But the problem with doing anything in renewables is that they're intermittent. They're not appropriate for city base load energy. And so today, if you want to power industry, if you want to power our you know, computation systems, which are approaching 10% of our electrical bill, if you want to, to power cities and industry, you've got to have 24 hour power. And terrestrial solar and wind struggle with that. Nuclear power has trouble scaling because of its need for cooling water. Fusion would have the same problem. So here we have something that if I just take those solar power uh, uh, the, the, those solar arrays, and if I could magically move them up into geostationary orbit, they're in the sunlight 99.9% .9 of the time, and I can beam it down with radio waves to where I would need it. So when you hear people, you know, talking about trying to use space to green the earth, to move, like Jeff Bezos says, to move industry off earth, or the need that you might need to, you know, to allow the developing world to have the kind of lifestyle that we are enjoying today, right? You don't have to do that at the cost of the earth. And in fact, I'll talk a little bit about how you could use space-based materials in order to construct it. So this creates then a competitive vision because we're not just talking about building one. And in the lower left, you see a picture of uh, John Mankin's uh, space solar power alpha satellite, a modular design. And you can see, you know, he had a collaboration with Justin Lewis Weber, who had looked at how you could use self-replicating systems on the moon to supply the material to build that. But we're not talking about just building one, right? We're talking about building, 
you know, 3,000 of these that scale to the approximately 55 terawatts of energy that a fully developed world of 10 or 11 billion people would need. One that would allow us to be 100% green, completely off fossil fuels, with the kind of power that we that our civilization actually needs. Now, how did I actually come to this? Well, it was in 2005, and I was playing a war game uh, sponsored by the great Andy Marshall, who has has now passed. A wonderful book about him, Last Warrior, and. Uh, I had become very concerned about energy as being a potential trigger for great power conflict. And at the same time, uh, I was enjoying my job as chief of future technology, where I was sort of the long-term trends and, uh, and technology scout for headquarters Air Force. And I came into contact with people from the uh, XPRIZE Foundation and Brad Edwards, from, uh, who had just written a book on the space elevator and uh, had gone to the state conference. And I kept hearing this idea of space solar power. And I, I, uh, I was doing some research, I looked it up, I found out uh, that at that particular moment in time, and for perhaps the next three or four months, there was a program at NASA uh, run by John Mankins. And so I asked John to come out and brief at the Pentagon. And John introduced me to this idea of space solar power. Um, and, and I just thought it was beautiful and aesthetic and the idea that we could innovate ourselves out of the problems of energy scarcity, out of the problem of sustainable development, out of the problem of uh, great nations competing over power and into this world of, of massive in-space manufacturing was amazing. And it stroked my ideas of ambition because, you know, just to give you a sense of comparison, right? That satellite you see at the lower left, when you compare that to the International Space Station, that's approximately 24 times heavier, approximately 100 times longer across, and about 50,000 times more power, right? The International Space Station is about 420 metric tons. It's about 100 kilowatts of power, and it's about 73 uh, meters across. A solar power satellite is like an aircraft carrier. It's 10,000 metric tons. It's producing not a megawatt, but a you know, at least 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 megawatts, uh, in, so gigawatts. And then you know, it is like seven kilometers across. And you're not going to build just one of these, right? You're going to build on the order of 3,000 of these in geostationary orbit to give the world the kind of amazing infrastructure that it deserves. And to me, this really spoke to me as a, a vision that was worthy of the ambition of our nation, right? Something that is orders of magnitude larger and more significant than that what was done in Apollo and something for which all the pieces are there, right? The, there's nothing cosmic about what you see there. That's just rockets launching components that are essentially, you know, lightweight reflectors like you'd buy in a, in a birthday balloon for your kids with transmitting antennas that are like in your cell phone and solar arrays like you might have on your house, right? I mean, yes, they're more sophisticated, but in truth, those are the basic pieces, right? Rockets, mirrors, solar cells and radio uh, transmitting elements. So it's not like fusion where we don't understand the science. It's more like you were a kid and you had built your first mud dam and then somebody wanted to hire you to go and build the Hoover Dam. You know, th this is a massive, massive amount of engineering detail work, but it's all based on principles that are well understood. So you've already heard this wonderful story about you know how uh, how you know four of us and then a huge army behind us uh, sort of did the very first crowdsourced open source study. And one of the things Coyote didn't mention was that he also gave the first ever virtual press conference in Second Life. Um, but we we provided this 
uh, uh, this study. And we really hoped, you know, uh, this was sort of a, a we had a transition. Uh, we were able to at least get in and stroke the interest of the White House, but not enough to get action. And it was the same repeated in the Obama White House. We there was uh, we, we thought we were going to move forward more than once. There was a wonderful white paper that Charles Miller and uh, the Space Frontier Foundation had on change.org. We thought that was going to pick up. There had been a study uh, at the time um, led by Air Force Research Lab sponsored out of my office uh, that unfortunately uh, was not continued actually out of fear that the Obama administration might like it and create an unfunded requirement for the uh, uh, for the Air Force. And then there was a later opportunity uh, later in the Obama administration to uh, to start a partnership with India that came within one vote of moving forward, uh, but it didn't. And I won't repeat sort of what happened here, uh, but uh, Michael, are we able to play this pitch video? Do I need to surrender the screen here? Yeah, pass it over to Fabio, please. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I'd like to thank uh, Chris at Mafic Studios for, uh, for, you know, having put together this, but we tried, you know, in order to sort of bring together our thinking at the time in this little pitch video that we have. Very few renewable energy sources scale large enough to displace fossil fuels and provide constant power. Space-based solar power satellites harness the power of the sun in space and transmits that power 24-7 to antennas on the ground, known as rectennas. Building them economically requires low-cost transport. All right, you can get me back the screen. Right. So while I'm bringing up my screen, I, I see a, a question from Brett about what happens if the, uh, if the beam misses where it, it's going. So the way these actually work, and I'm sure that uh, 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 John Mankins would be a, a better person to answer these questions than me, but essentially, you know, you you have a pilot beam that comes from the Earth that's that is required to sort of uh, time and focus the beam, and then you know because these are electronic circuits, like in a like in a modern uh, fighter jet radar, you know, we're talking about the ability to adjust or realize something is wrong on, on the scale of milliseconds. So, you know, work didn't stop. You know, I went on uh, to spend a year and a half in India where I wrote Sky's No Limit, talking about how we might be able to do a partnership. Uh, General Santee, who, who uh, uh, took over space policy, asked me to sort of lay out the strategic case for space solar power in uh, strategic studies quarterly. And of course, you know, several people were involved in the fast space report which basically laid out uh, the, the case for the United States to invest in reusable launch vehicles uh, to kick off this virtuous cycle and the, the decreased cost that comes from industrial learning and high flight rates that you see on the right. Uh, you know, we basically laid out the vision that has now become the Space Development uh, Agency uh, uh, vision for proliferated low Earth orbit command and control. Um, and we discussed, you know, how this virtuous cycle could lead to uh, cost-effective space solar power. And this was, of course, uh, you know, long before we started the report before the true successes in reusable launch. I should also note uh, that uh, two of the other participants in the study, uh, Mike Sneed has written Astroelectricity and has a number of truly terrific uh, educational videos on why the United States really has to turn to space solar power. John Mankins, who you'll hear later today, has the wonderful book on the case for space solar power. Paul Jaffe led a team you know, to look at the opportunities and challenges for beaming to uh, remote installations that was very helpful in creating the two uh, small programs that the United States has today. And of course, if you want to, to hear more about the geopolitical implications and the broader than the book by myself and the Murata Goswami that just came out, Scramble for the Skies, uh, covers space solar power in depth. There was also a, an effort called the, uh, the D3, the Defense Diplomacy and Development Challenge that was run by the State Department, the Department of Defense and USAID where many teams and many ideas competed and a team that Paul Jaffe and I uh, put together 
actually swept that uh, winning, you know, most of the awards. Uh, and you can understand why, because an idea like this is amazing for international development. It's amazing for U.S. security. And it's amazing for di uh, diplomacy. If you could truly be leading the world towards, you know, gr infinite green energy uh, that solves so many different global problems. Paul, of course, has done, you know, magnificent work. You know, he had uh, uh, a small po uh, wireless power beaming uh, experiment broadcast uh, for, for STEM education on the International Space Station. Uh, he recently orbited this piece of hardware up here, Pram FX, on uh, the uh, Department of the Air Force X-37B space plane. And he's uh, done this uh, petrol or power transmission over laser. And of course, you will hear later on about the very ambitious uh, attempt by Air Force Research Lab to break the one meter barrier uh, with ultralight uh, sandwich array modules. So something similar to what you see on the top right here, but ultra thin. Um, but, you know, of course, another consequence of this report that Coyote and I uh, did was that uh, it interested uh, our, uh, our competitors. And so China has this very coherent uh, vision that they want to exploit Earth moon space you know, using lunar resources to construct solar power satellites that would beam energy back to Earth, part of this larger project of Chinese rejuvenation. And they have a wonderful video uh, that won an international competition that I will post in showing their design for in-space uh, construction of this uh, 11 kilometer across thing. And of course, you know, they recognize that the moon is crucial for sustainable development and whoever conquers the moon uh, will benefit first. So, uh, you know, they have a complete roadmap with multiple different designs and they have, uh, they are funding a, a, a significant uh, sort of development park uh, with major infrastructure in order to uh, advance space solar power. On the other end, we also have domestically, you know, I, probably not everybody caught this, but when uh, uh, Jeff Bezos unveiled Blue Moon, he had up in the corner a uh, news clipping, and the news clipping was of his first uh, uh, interview, where he said that you know if if he were a space entrepreneur, he would construct solar power satellites to make the world peaceful and affluent through cheap, abundant energy. It wasn't what he chose to highlight in the public, but it, but it was there, uh, so it may hint at his longer term ambitions. Space solar power also creates an industrial base that unlocks unbelievable things that you probably could never purchase on your own. I mean, just imagine that today, you know, we spend less than half a percent of our federal budget on, uh, on all the civilian space programs, right? It's a tiny fraction and that's, you know, maybe somewhere around the order of 30% of GDP. So we are spending, you know, whatever, you know, less than a third of a percent of GDP on space. But energy is at least 8% of global GDP. And so, you know, a hundred trillion dollar economy means that somewhere on the order of $10 trillion goes for energy. And if you were doing most of your energy from space, you would have an annual revenue stream for your space program on the order of $10 trillion, which is many, many orders of magnitude larger than what we can afford on the public budget. Once you have created the ability to do massive in-space manufacturing, massive space logistics for these 10,000 metric ton satellites, you now have an infrastructure that would allow you to build real estate, you know, large space stations. You have the infrastructure you would need to send interstellar probes to see what's on other planets, including to be able to build large generation ships within reasonable time uh, cycles. You have the power available to you know, burn up or deflect asteroids, and you have the infrastructure you would need to do you know, complex management of the Earth's biosphere to maintain life like the proposed uh, uh, Sun-Earth L1 sunshade. And all this contributes to, you know, uh, 
broad national power. So in the same way that, you know, the discovery of replaceable parts for a uh, production line and petroleum and internal combustion engine, you know, few people could have foreseen how those simple parts at the top could scale to be this unbelievably massive infrastructure below that gave rise to national wealth and power and upon which our platforms for national defense rests, many people have difficulty seeing how these simple technologies, you know, of uh, RF antennas and solar arrays, you know, rocket ships and mirrors could lead to something infinitely vaster than what's contemplated today. Um, you know, many things have happened uh, since this was first considered, of course, you know, reusability and high launch tempo completely alter the, the cost of launch, but satellite cost, you know, and satellite mass has come down. And so the ability to think about uh, these types of reductions, these slides are from Paul Jaffe, uh, you know, open up a world of possibility in terms of making this not a technical possibility, which it's been for many decades now, but an economic uh, possibility. Um, you know, I, you may hear a similar point made by one of our later speakers, but there's already an amazing proof of concept of how this can be done. So Starlink now has launched in the last year, 1,300 satellites, each of which has about six kilowatts on board. And if you combine that together, that is 7.8 megawatts of power in space put up by one company in one year with an enormous uh, reduction in cost. And so again, a slide from John just showing what industrial learning curves do uh, to the individual cost of something. So you cannot think about scale on the chicken and egg problem the same when you're talking about something this massive. And of course, we've talked about reusability. Um, let me just get out of that there. And of course, what's coming, you know, with potentially extremely low cost uh, for, uh, uh, for Starship. This is sort of what we had looked at at the time, you know, is that, you know, we could imagine, you know, from where we were then with fully reusable systems, first the three three x reduction, and then depending on the number of launches, and some of this, you know, launch may seem, you know, crazy to people today, but it's such a, you know, tiny piece, you know, drop in the bucket compared to what we do in transportation, in airplanes, on roads, and on uh, on water, that, you know, getting to, you know, a a daily launch, you know, of about three you know, 300, you know, plus launches a year that gets you to a kind of 10 times reduction, not with any kind of, you know, technology change, just in the amortization of your overall costs is pretty exciting. You know, you get down to the cost of propellant, you know, which might be somewhere around, you know, $25, uh, you know, uh, per pound. And all this enables this broader cislunar econosphere you know, of being able to, you know, move uh, with reusable in-space vehicles to and from the moon and to be able to source resources from the moon, to be able to do these kind of advanced uh, in-space manufacturing and production that could allow entirely different types of designs. And of course, to access materials to be able to do this and build it in-space rather than bringing it up from Earth and say the second or third generation. Uh, just to give you a sense, right, one asteroid Apophis would allow you to build 150 solar power satellites in terms of mass. And there's the possibility here of, uh, of robots building robots and electromagnetic launch from the moon, other large infrastructure that could be there. And it's going to be necessary, right, if, you, if we have a societal goal of trying to cap carbon we have to have something that can scale and can scale rapidly. And I think space solar power offers the possibility of doing that as well as an amazing possibility you know, for jobs. I think this was uh, 5 million direct uh, 
uh, Jobs that was in the IAA report, if I remember right. And if you look at markets, you know, this, this was Ivan Becky who had done this for the NDU space power study that Coyote and I uh, actually met uh, in this. Uh, but this is a logarithmic scale. And the important thing to realize is this is the amount of projected up mass from Earth to space. And the biggest line there, the one that dwarfs everything else is this green line and that's solar power satellites. So of all the possible markets that we can imagine today that let's say aren't, you know, O'Neill colonies in the long term, you know, this is really the big, uh, the big up mass possibility. John may show you a slide similar to this, but just showing that if you do apples to apples comparison of space solar power, you know, it is, as Coyote said, it, it's an amazing difference in the uh, effective power to the grid. And, you know, John may cover this too, you know, just how much a single power satellite could cover in terms of uh, power shifting. And then, you know, in terms of carbon, it's amazing. Not only is its energy payback in weeks, uh, but, you know, the, the carbon you have is just to manufacture the solar power satellite. And after that, it's gone and you can use that to bootstrap. So it's a, it, it is truly friendly. And of course, this aids as part of this broader interplanetary, multiplanetary uh, aspiration. You know, why does this work? Well, the sun puts out this amazing amount of energy, you know, of, of those Yoda watts of uh, energy, you know, 120,000 terawatts hit the Earth's surface at the equator, you know, at the, at the equator in peak sunlight, you know, you get like a thousand watts per meter squared, but you get nothing at night in the same place. And of course, you know, you're going to be reduced by seasons and weather so that most temperate places like the United States are getting just 125 to 375 watts per meter squared. Now, if you could just move that up into space, you now suddenly, you know, collect nine to 11 times as much, you know, flux over time. And then you have much greater availability. You don't have to worry about, you know, spring and summer and weather and all that. Uh, and you beam it down to these rectennas that can be, you know, multi-use. You can have, you know, agricultural or pastoral underneath uh, it's about the size of a small airport. You know, the land is still good for agriculture. You know, the beam is shaped in a way such that it's like somewhere on the order of a sixth the intensity of, of uh, sunlight in the center and tapers off to, uh, you know, safe levels at the edge. And because it's collecting all the time, not just for 20% of the day, like a solar power satellite is, it ends up being like at least six times you know, more power, even without the, uh, uh, the specifics of weather or, uh, you know, back and forth. So again, you know, the significance, 24 hour base load appropriate power, almost no renewable can say that. M maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, sorry, I'm, I'm losing my, uh, my train of thought here. So, you know, a giant um, hydroelectric could do that, but we just don't have enough hydroelectric opportunities. So it's urban appropriate. It's got the scale that can displace coal that can reduce the need for nuclear proliferation. And most importantly, it can scale to all global demands six times over with just the geo resource. So that's why it's significant. You know, we had, we had calculated that, you know, like, you know, AFRL, uh, had calculated that the, the resource was on the order of 330 terawatts. And we wanted to sort of give you a sense that if you were to just, you wouldn't do it this way, but if you were to build, you know, a one kilometer band around geo, you know, the amount of energy you would collect is the amount of energy that's in all remaining oil in all uh, resources, which is, you know, just an astounding amount. Um, so like I said, super simple components, things that we're very familiar with. It just takes a lot of them. And uh, let's see, some of these are there. You know, I, I will say, 
Uh, Michael, should I give up the, uh, the the microphone here? Or you want me to keep going? Let's bring you and Coyote back in, and we've got about ten ish minutes to uh, to chat before uh, General Quas gets here. But I am really excited to hear the rebuttals to Musk's arguments. That'd be helpful. 